My name is David Burke, and I'm a member of the community here, and it's great to see you this morning. Welcome. I'm here to check on your summer plans. School's out. Memorial Day has come and gone. If you were here about a month ago, you'll recall that Pastor Kelly, who's away today, invited each of us to spend some time thinking about the summer and what we could plan so that at the end of the summer, we could look back and find that we love God, love people, and love creation more than we did at the beginning of the summer. Who, anybody feel like they made a plan, is sticking to the plan, and is already seeing some results? You don't have to raise your hand. You can, but you don't have to. Um, well, good news, there's plenty of summer left. It's not too late. Now, you might already know that we're calling our current series Act Out, in which we're using the book of Acts as a means of, of understanding Jesus' vision for the church. Acts has a central theme of mission near and far, so it seems like not only the right book for our theme this year, which is look out, like look outward, but it really feels like the right book for this morning because this is a pinnacle sort of week in, our, in which our community is really practicing looking and acting outside our own interests. Can we do an unscientific survey? This is where you do raise your hand, okay? Um, how many of you are aware of the trip to the Dominican Republic happening this week? All right, bunch of you, but not everybody. Great, we're well, going to hear all about it right now. This is the week. Um, this is a brand new thing. We have, ed this Edgers community has never done a thing of the scale that's going on right now. Uh, and what I had planned to say uh, is that the mission team is currently on a layover in the airport watching on the live stream, uh, but I don't think that's happening. Their flight was canceled this morning. They drove all the way to Raleigh super early to find out that their flight was canceled. Ugh, what a bummer. Um, so I think they're on a plane right now, but we should live, we should wave to them on the live stream anyway. All right, ready? Camera's right up there. Everybody give them a wave. Hey, guys. Hope you're having a great time. <laughs> Hope you get there safe and have a great week. So uh, on this trip to the Dominican Republic, they're headed for a week of service, fun, and community with a group called the New Hope Girls Academy. And uh, I bet those 25 people are going to have a great week. I bet also the 16 local staff and volunteers from New Hope Girls are also about to have a great week, along with 120 campers, girls ages 6 to 16, who have rarely in their lives gotten to experience a week of carefree fun in the way they're about to. Awesome. I can't wait to hear all about it, and hear about it we will when our travelers come home. Speaking of those travelers, um, Oh, I covered that, sorry. That's where I had it written, like, they're in the airport, but they're not in the airport. <laughs> Moving on. So even though we in the room are going to have to live that fun-filled trip vicariously through them, it's still a good and important week to be here in this space because we've got opportunities here that will help us love God and people and creation more. And our friends bound for the DR will just have to live those fun-filled things vicariously through us. So there. More on that in a little bit. First, let's cover some specifics about the book of Acts. It's also known as the Acts of the Apostles, apostle being a word for either the first person sent on a mission to a specific place or one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Much of the book relays stories of those apostles traveling from place to place, very often staying in the homes of other believers they barely knew while bearing witness of their experience to Jesus, of Jesus. Some of those stories are groundbreaking and scandalous, some are tragic, others are triumphant, but overall, they're joyful. Some of those stories, as you read through the book, um, would make it easy to assume that everything in the book took place over a matter of months. But the book encompasses stories and events that occurred over about 30 years. It took me a long time personally to clear up that misconception uh, for myself, and when I did, it totally reframed my understanding the early church wasn't some flash-in-the-pan overnight success like I thought it had been. It was, and maybe still is, the kind of slow uphill climb that just isn't possible without God and a community of people supporting it. And if you really dissect the entire book, you'll find about 16 or so main storylines. 16 stories in 30 years. According to my calculations, that averages to about two years per story. That realization kind of blew my mind and made me think, wow, that's so much time. What's not in the book? 
They must have had plenty of downtime. So what was going on behind the scenes? I wonder, if we read between the lines, whether there's something to learn. I wonder if God used those behind-the-scenes things, mundane though they may seem, as a way to hold the community together, making those 16 storylines possible. And if God used those behind-the-scenes things then, I wonder if God can still use them now to hold this community together and make big storylines possible. Hospitality is one of those behind-the-scenes things. As I mentioned, as the apostles traveled around, they needed a place to live. And as far as we can tell, they usually stayed with folks who were already local to the place they were visiting. We get fly-by statements like in chapter 9, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Or in chapter 14, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Statements like that are littered throughout Acts. They barely get a mention, but throughout the book we see people agreeing to share their time and space with others. And I wonder if that community is foundational to both the small moments and the big storylines that come after. Today we're going to focus on Acts chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, in which the Apostle Paul travels to Corinth, a place brand new to him. It says, that's where he discovered Aquila, a Jew born in Pontus, and his wife Priscilla. They had just arrived from Italy, part of the general expulsion of Jews from Rome ordered by Claudius. Paul moved in with them, and they worked together at their common trade of tent making. But every Sabbath, he was at the meeting place, doing his best to convince both Jews and Greeks about Jesus. So Paul meets this couple. They have some things in common. An arrangement is worked out, and Paul moves in. I wonder what the conversation was like between the couple, Priscilla and Aquila, as they considered the idea. Were they grateful for help with the rent? Did they doubt the wisdom or safety of inviting a man into their home that they didn't really know? We don't know what they thought about it, but we know they agreed. Once Paul settled in, I wonder if there was a drama. Was he always, like, leaving his cereal bowl in the sink? Or was he getting toothpaste all over the sink? These were the first two um, things I could come up with of annoying behavior, so I guess I really hate a messy sink. <laughs> um, for a while, Paul just spent one day a week in the synagogue, which left the rest of the week for working with his housemates and also for hanging out with his housemates. That's a lot of time together. I bet they got to know things like what the others in the group like to eat, who's the funny one, who's a morning person, and who is not. They probably got to know something about each other's families, upbringing, experiences. As they ate together, I bet they become, became comfortable enough to ask each other good questions and really listen to honest answers. When they prayed together, I wonder if they talked about their dreams for the future, their doubts over whether what they were doing in life would ever matter. We don't know that it was Paul's influence that led Priscilla and Aquila to become Christians, but we know they did. The friendship they developed became so real that when it was time for Paul to leave Corinth, Priscilla and Aquila left too, on the same ship. Though they ended up in different places, we know they stayed in touch. We know because about five years later, Paul writes a letter to the church in Rome. In Romans 16, 3 through 5, we hear, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, this is Paul writing, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. And this is where I think we can start to make some connections. Working together, eating together, and praying together seems to have helped Priscilla and Aquila love people more. At least Paul, anyway. We just learned that they somehow risked their lives for him. We also learned that they've opened their new home as a place for people to gather and worship. I wonder what the conversation like was again between the couple when they decided to invite the people to worship in their home. Did they feel like they were taking a risk? Did their time living with Paul make opening their home again seem more natural this time? We don't know, but ultimately they had the faith to try it. As I prepared for this week, I got to thinking about how working together, eating together, or praying together with people has impacted my own faith. I got to thinking about the early days of our Edges Church, this one. 
I wasn't around for the very beginning of Edges, but I joined early on. And did you know that we used to meet in the basement of this building? Yeah. We were such a tiny community that this space seemed too cavernous for us, so we met downstairs where the walls and ceiling aren't so far apart. As our numbers grew, we prepared for a move to the upstairs into this space, and that time holds several of my favorite ever Edges memories. They're the kinds of events that wouldn't even get a flyby mention in the Book of Acts. One is the evening a dozen or so of us met in this space to unbox, then assemble the very tables which are currently holding up your coffee. Some of you in the room may have been here that night too, building tables or painting doors, which was also going on. That may not sound to you like the stuff of favorite memories, but it is. Trust me, I was there. I was in a fragile place at that time in my life and was terribly inexperienced in social situations. I didn't get social, social cues and barely knew how to carry on a conversation that wasn't directly related to accomplishing a certain purpose. So having a shared goal, build the tables, was a great distraction from the weight of social awkwardness that I was otherwise feeling. The task enabled me to talk and listen to people I didn't yet know in a setting that felt safe. Carving out the time and showing up to do something in support of others wasn't easy, but there was a practical result. And the intangible result for me and my workmates was that we loved people a little more. Over time, we could look back and see that we'd moved as if by magic from casual acquaintances toward real meaningful friendship. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? I've been through plenty of situations working or eating with people that did nothing to help me love people more. <laughs> Remember those feelings of social awkwardness? I mentioned it's a low bar for me to love people less. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes the difference between interactions that lead us to love people more and interactions that don't? That's a good thing to work out together, I think, which is something we do often here at Edges. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to gather with a few folks near you and talk about that. Be sure to share your names, and if you've been here a while, look around and make sure everybody's included. And know that if you prefer to just listen today, that's fine. Now go ahead and break into groups, and you'll see a couple of questions on screen. I'll give you about three minutes. Go ahead.
All right, friends, time to bring it back. Finish up that last idea. And let's talk about this together for a minute. <clears throat> All right, sounds like lots of ideas around the room. Let's start with that first question. The question was, what conditions make the difference between interactions that lead us to love people more and interactions that don't. So what I'll ask you to do now is um, to call out back to the group a little snippet of, of something that you heard in your group, something that was uh, that worth sharing with, with everybody. That first question, what do you think? What makes the, what conditions make the difference? Go for it. Oh, attitude. I thought you said, I have two. <laughs> Just, let's hear them. Attitude. All right, what else? Respect. Trust. Trust. Encouragement. Encouragement. Open mindedness. Uh, okay, so the the um the exchange of an invitation extended and accepted rather than being assigned. Purpose. Taking the time to get to know people. It does take time. And that's time we don't spend doing some other thing. Yeah, so Aaron said the length of time involved in the interaction. So the team staying in DR for a week gives them a whole week to get to know people versus a, a quick interaction at the grocery store or some, some kind of passing thing. All right, what about that next question? So we got this list of things, great list. What can a person do to help those conditions flourish? To listen. To listen. Be present. Be present. Trying to look at other people through God's eyes. Choose positive interactions instead of negative ones, like where, as far as our response or, yeah. Being persistent. How about one more? Oh, just kidding, that was the last one. You don't have any more, okay. All right, moving on. Well, I think you're right. It's probably not just one thing that makes the difference. But it seems that our attitude, purpose, respect, trust, accepting an invitation, extending an invitation, listening, being present, our willingness to look for a person for, um, through God's eyes at another person, maybe all those things together can make a difference. Here's another idea. It's related. Um, and according to Matthew's gospel, it comes directly from Jesus. In Matthew 18, verse 20, Jesus promises, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. Some translations say two or more are gathered in my name. Could it be that simple? Is there a certain way of being around others that just causes Jesus' spirit to be present somehow? To figure out whether you or I could believe that, I think we'd have to understand it better first. So what does it mean to gather in Jesus' name? I don't have an authoritative answer on that, but I can tell you that my view of gathering in Jesus' name is to gather in the same way he always gathered, focused on causes and values that bring about love, like kinship with people on the margins, kindness, justice, mercy, including honesty, healing, forgiveness, and I bet you could name a bunch more. 
when we gather in the spirit of any of those things, maybe we're gathering with God's spirit too. And maybe that's the difference. But when we don't engage with others, or when we gather in a spirit of gossip, or greed, or selfishness, or exclusion, maybe we'll find we have to be in charge of those moments. Maybe Jesus doesn't show up to those gatherings. Making moments like that feel like a dead end. It's because we're doing those less than moments on our own. If that's true, if all that's true, then just like a math problem, we ought to be able to go back and check our work, right? So I invite you to do that this week. If you think back to situations in your own life that led you to love people more, do they align with the kind of values that God champions? And in situations that didn't lead us to love people more, did they align with values God champions? Understanding what we believe about this is important because it may help us sort out how and where we choose to invest ourselves when it comes to people. Let's look together back at the example of Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila. Did they connect on a deeply meaningful level because their friendship was rooted in the kind of values God wants to champion? Paul was there to share the story of Jesus' love, mercy, and forgiveness. Priscilla and Aquila opened their home to Paul in a way that included him and was kind. The results of their friendship had ripple effects for centuries. We're talking about them today. Is that because God's Spirit was with them? Now, there is a catch, and it's that to practice interactions that, leading, that lead us to love people more, we need people. And though there are more people in the world today than ever before, we humans are more lonely than ever before. Almost all, almost all of us struggle to connect regularly and meaningfully with others. I know I do. Over the years, our Edges community has become my go-to for regular and meaningful connection with others. The most effective form for me has been our home groups. Like many of you, I was part of a home group during the school year, which I love because it's a great way for me to connect with other people. The structure and the safety of a small group environment eases the stress that I feel in big, unstructured groups. This summer, right now, Edges is offering book discussion groups before worship. Anyone can join any time, so I join the one that Dean's leading right now about climate change. It's helping me to love creation more while I also get to connect regularly and meaningfully with the rest of the group. And now there's one more major opportunity I'm going to highlight today that some of you have heard about already. <clears throat> Remember when I said it's good to be in Blacksburg this week, even while the DR folks are away? And remember when I said there's something they'll have to live vicariously through us? And remember when I said um, it's going to be great and fun-filled? Well, get ready. That thing is helping out another of our partner organizations, Harding Avenue Elementary School, right down the street. And by my count, it checks lots of boxes. It's an opportunity to work together, to eat together, and pray together with this EDGES community in support of others, doing work that really will not get done if we don't do it. And like I said, it's going to be fun, I promise. Here's how it'll work, starting with the work. My daughter, Adeline, is a rising fifth grader at Harding, and some of us will pack and move boxes in preparation for the new trailers that will house fifth grade classes in the fall. Thank you in advance for helping to prepare my daughter's classroom. <laughs> I wonder if moving some boxes around together could help you or me love our edges people more. Perhaps you'd like to garden. There are some lovely gardens around the school, but the weeds don't pull themselves. I wonder if you'll find you love creation more after spending time out in it with our community. Finally, there are teachers who have waited years for new paint on their classroom walls. If painting is your thing, I wonder if you'd find you love people more when you consider how teachers and kids will feel when they come back this fall to fresh colors in the space they're going to spend so much time in. And I'm confident that I will love God more following pizza together for lunch. <laughs> Looking around the room, I can tell who's already connected 
to our partners at Harding Avenue because they look excited. They're excited because they know how much next Sunday is going to mean to the staff and kids at Harding. We'll gather here at 1030, just like you usually do. So this is worship next week. We're going to gather at 1030 and worship by going to work at Harding. Come dress to paint or pack or pull weeds in comfort. And now, as I look around the room, I can see who is most deeply connected to comfortable clothing because they look excited. <laughs> and don't worry about all these details right now because you'll get a reminder in the email this week. <laughs>